Before we get into today's episode, we want to remind listeners to always exercise caution when foraging for and introducing new medicinal plants into your routine, which includes mushrooms. Do your research, consult and learn from mushroom experts, and talk with your healthcare providers. Now, let's get into today's exciting episode. Welcome to the Mother Earth News and Friends podcast. Mushrooms are exploding in public interest, from food to medicinal uses to fashion. So we're taking a whole podcast episode to talk about just how valuable they really are. William Padilla Brown, founder and CEO of Mycosymbiotics, joins us to talk about truffle mushrooms and answer some frequently asked questions about how to identify them, their benefits and potential, and how to use them. This is Mother Earth News. Have you ever wanted to meet our podcast presenters in person or take workshops from them? You can by going to one of our many Mother Earth News fairs each year. You can take hands-on workshops, attend information-filled presentations, and shop from our many vendors specializing in DIY ideas, homesteading, and natural health. Our last fair of 2023 is coming up in West Bend, Wisconsin, September 16th to 17th, and you can meet many past podcast guests there. Visit MotherEarthNewsFair.com to register, and be sure to use the code FAIRGUEST for $5 off at checkout. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Mother Earth News and Friends podcast. I'm Jessica Mitchell and joining me today is William Padilla Brown. At Mother Earth News for 50 years and counting, we've been dedicated to conserving our planet's natural resources while helping you conserve your financial resources. Today, we're going to be learning about mushrooms, specifically truffle mushrooms, and how you can identify them and use them. We have some great Q&A coming up with William. So welcome to the podcast, William. Thanks for having me. Thanks for platforming my work. I really appreciate you guys and all the information that you put out into the world. Thanks. We're so excited to have you on today. And I thought we could take some time to get to know you a little bit before we jump into our conversation on truffles. So to start, do you want to just uh, tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Right on. Uh, Yeah, my name is William Padilla Brown. I uh, own and operate Mycosymbiotics, which is an ecological research laboratory that's based out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We off and on operate mushroom farms, but we do a lot of work around permaculture. I'm sure a lot of the audience is familiar with permaculture, and if not, you know, maybe take a moment to uh, learn a little bit about it. But it's a whole system design science where we work with different aspects of uh, the natural world to create more resilient human systems. So. Uh, We work with algae, we work with insects, we do urban agriculture, uh, composting, and a lot of different educational events. We do farmer's markets where we sell mushrooms that we cultivate, and uh, we also uh, have a line of mushroom supplement products um, that we sell online and at various grocery stores around the country in independent shops. Yeah, so that's the business. And I'm just a family guy. You know, I got two kids, me and my lady. Uh, We live out here in Pennsylvania. I travel around teaching people how to get engaged with uh, the natural world and how to get engaged with permaculture. That's amazing. So what drew you to study mushrooms, algae, like all those different things you were talking about that are in mycosymbiotics? Um, What really inspired you to get involved in the natural world like that? Um, Whenever I was young, I dropped out of high school when I was 16 because it was interfering with my education because I felt as though I learned all the things I needed to learn um, to navigate the world I was presented with, but I didn't know enough about the things that I wanted to know about the natural world, about physics, about a whole bunch of different things that I took upon myself to just start researching. The reason that I chose to start studying the things that I did is because All of the data, all of the evidence that was presented to me, and I had the unique experience of also traveling around the world with my mom and traveling around the U.S. with my dad as I was growing up and seeing a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different reality. 
is that a lot of the systems that we depend on around the world are unsustainable. A lot of people are hearing this word, but don't realize that this means that at some point it will not be able to continue. Uh, I don't think that that's really under fully understood. But when we say that, you know, this industry is unsustainable, we now have enough comp uh, computers, a computational power to tell you when it will not be sustainable anymore. Um, so with understanding that at a young age, I was like, OK, I can't it does not make any any sense to invest in any of these systems in a sense of with my money or with my dependency. Like, why would I learn how to become dependent on a system that at some point will fail me? I'd rather figure out how to do something else that I can have more autonomy over or that is um, easier to fix if something goes wrong. In doing that, I also realized, you know, it's a big world. There's a lot of people out there. You know, I can find local success in doing some of these things. But if I want to really be heard and really make a difference in this movement in the way that I believe that I could, it would take being nuanced and literate in a lot of the undervalued or underappreciated parts of the new realities that we're trying to build. So in working with permaculture, I realized that this design system was going to become very effective into the future. And a lot of permaculture designers didn't really know much about fungi, didn't know much about algae, didn't know much about doing social permaculture. It was like a lot of land-based uh, permaculture. So I was like, okay, these parts are undervalued. If I learn how to become literate with this, this is where I'll find my niche and my ability to like amplify myself into the space. So that's really what led me to work with algae, uh, with fungi, with insects, because I can clearly see how valuable they are in the ecosystem. I know more people are going to recognize this at some point. So I wanted to be able to like help guide people into these spaces. Thank you for sharing that. I love that answer and the story of how you got there. Because we're talking today about truffles and, and focusing mm -hmm. on mushrooms, why do you think we're kind of talking about how the systems you're focusing on and helping people learn more about mushrooms and algae, especially in terms of like permaculture and those types of systems. Why do you think mushrooms are an integral part of developing this sustainable and hopeful future that we're envisioning? Well, I mean, if we look at their uh, ecological function in, in a lot of senses, they're I mean, the majority are acting like uh, saprophytic organisms that are helping to break down complex materials created in the environment into less complex material for it to be recycled into the system, mostly through plants and, and animals and things. More common terms like, you know, trees and, and other debris are falling down in the forest and fungi are, are, are eating them and breaking them down so that they can be turned into soil so that the trees can use them or the fruit mushrooms that animals will eat or we will eat. Um, and then the nutrient cycle continues. So in creating these complex built environments, we have oftentimes overlooked the recycling aspect or the waste aspect and kind of just say, we're going to throw this away without realizing there is no such thing as a way. Where is a way? A way is somewhere for somebody, you know? So this mindset of just throwing it away and like ridding your mind of it is kind of baloney. And then also that we keep building with new materials is wild. So I think that fungi is really coming in as a saving grace in this moment where a lot of our industries are going to become unsustainable and showing us and giving us an incredible teacher and showing us how we can break down complexity and then reutilize it. So I think that's one of the biggest roles is like that just symbolic function of, of fungi and teaching us the lesson about how to integrate that into our human systems because we've overlooked a lot of this. So I think that that's where it can be very helpful. And then, you know, everybody's just ranting about all the different aspects from like <laughs> medicine to building materials. Like, you know, you got people making clothing, bags, faux leather, insulation, novel antibiotics. There's all sorts of just nuances in, in what fungi can do. And I think that the autonomy that they deliver to individuals and community in the sense that kids are teaching themselves how to grow mushrooms, grow fungi. If you can grow mushrooms, then you're probably able to figure out how to utilize that mycelium to do a lot of these other things that people are talking about. That gives individuals autonomy over their lives, over their community, over their livelihood that a lot of people haven't had before. It allows people to directly interact with wealth from waste. All wealth comes from nature. All value comes from nature. And fungi are increasing in value on a daily basis, and they're able to grow from 
agricultural and urban waste streams. So I think that this really puts a lot of autonomy in individuals' hands, which is beneficial. And it's like not necessarily like value or wealth in the sense of dollar bills, but people can end up with a lot of valuable functional mushrooms that may be beneficial for supplementing your health or a lot of edible mushrooms that may be good for eating in a place where they didn't have as much food. That is wealth to me and in, in moving into the future with our our currency uh, so destabilized and inflating, that wealth becomes more valuable day to day. So being able to directly interact with it whenever like, you know, the oyster room might be like seven to $15 for a pound um, at, at the store where you're at, maybe even more, but you just grew it on coffee grounds. That's wealth. Well, I hope that pumps people up for seeing the value of mushrooms. And as we jump into this, this podcast about truffles today, I think that really helps set the stage for We're not just talking about something that people throw on pasta or something, you know, we're talking about something so much more valuable than that. So I'm excited to get into these questions now. So I thought we could start with just super building block question first. Within this, you know, realm of fungi, how would you describe a truffle mushroom? And are there different kinds of truffles out there? There are a lot of different kinds of truffles. Truffle diversity is almost as diverse as above mushrooms, uh, above ground mushrooms. Truffles are apigeous fungi. It means they grow underground. Mushrooms that grow above ground are hypogeous. And we don't really utilize these words that often in mycology because most people are interacting with above ground mushrooms and not with below ground mushrooms. But a lot of mushrooms have gone through this evolutionary trend where they start to close up their gills and go underground. So I implore people to start listening to what I'm saying without your lifespan bias. A lot of people, you know, they're like, I'm born in this time and I'll probably live to be 80 years old. And I live in this time era or this time frame. And a lot of times that like has us looking at the natural world, almost like a pause screen on the television, because nature is in a hundreds of millions of year, billion year flow of things what they once were becoming something different. So we're witnessing everything in a transitionary phase. Again, there's this trend of mushrooms, like a lot of mushrooms at some point in time realize, oh, I'm fruiting up above ground. My gills are susceptible to being eaten, to drying up, to weather damage. So they started to go closer to the ground. And then there's grasses started to grow. Plants start to grow. So they're like, oh, we can hide in this microclimate of small vegetation that provides us with more moisture to protect our gills. They start then to close up completely and turn into puffball looking mushrooms. And then they start to go underground where the temperature is more consistent, the moisture is more consistent, then they become entirely underground mushrooms. But in doing this, they have to rely on animals to disperse their spores because their spores are all underground inside of them. This is where they develop very unique relationships. But a lot of the truffles, gourmet truffles that we like are truffle morel species. So there's truffle morels, truffle chanerelles, truffle bolites. There's all different kinds of truffles from different mushrooms that have just gone through this evolutionary trend of turning into a a tuber mushroom that is underground. Uh, Most truffles are ectomycorrhizal, meaning that the fungus body, the mycelial body, lives on the outside of the roots of different plants and trees that they have association with. And they fruit seasonally, producing a lot of very intense aromatic compounds and rewarding pleasurable compounds uh, for animals to come eat. Some of them being incredibly ancestral production of endocannabinoids like anandamide, which can induce adult neurogenesis, can induce bliss states. So they bring the mammals in with a strong smell, reward them with food, with nutrients, with beneficial compounds. And then those mammals will take those spores and and release them somewhere else in their excrement around, probably around similar trees for them to start their life over again. There is a lot of different truffles. There's a small amount of them are like the gourmet ones that we like, but there's just an incredible diversity of truffles that are doing all sorts of things and can have incredible medicinal benefit, especially because they're living underground with a lot more pressure from organisms all around them trying to consume them and they have to be able to make it to maturity healthy. So they're producing a lot of unique chemistry that may be able to be harnessed in a, in a medical sense. We had one question from a reader asking kind of within this kinds of truffles, what's the difference between a white truffle and a black truffle? 
a lot of different variation in species in white truffle and black truffle. Like we have summer black truffle, spring black truffle, like tuberous divium and tuber melanosporum from the European varieties. We also have tuber magnatum, which is classic white truffle from Europe. That one is still the most expensive truffle in the world. But we have Oregon white truffles or white truffles from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we also have a couple varieties of tuber leonii that appear um, to be more whitish. But those are lesser known white truffles in the U.S. But there's a lot of variation in the characteristics. Um, they're producing different aromatic compounds. They have different nutritional profiles. And a lot of the black truffles will have uh, some level of melanin. So their melanistic is why, is why they have that black. There's a lot of differences between them. There's a lot of differences between the different species of black truffles. I mean, I feel like just even listening to that answer, that just opens up like a whole other podcast episode, just talking about the differences between those. With all of these truffles that exist, are all of them edible or only a few? And how can we identify an edible truffle versus a toxic one or a toxic lookalike? All right. So there's debate around this because there's some people that believe that all truffles are edible because they're supposed to be eaten by mammals or they're supposed to be eaten by an animal. But because there's as much diversity, like there are truffle amanita and amanitas are of a class of mushrooms that, you know, have toxins in them that can hurt you um, if not prepared correctly. So I do believe that there are truffles that will lead to gastrointestinal distress. I do believe truffles are a little bit safer to experiment with. We live in the best time for figuring out whether the mushrooms are edible or not with all the analytical uh, equipment that we have from uh, chemical analytics with like liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, and then like molecular analytics. Um, we can see if they even have genes that are capable of producing things that can hurt us, or we can like test them for known mycotoxins to see if they're producing anything that can hurt us. So just working with local universities, but there's a lot of freaky truffle eaters that have been like just eating unknown truffles and not dying. So I would say just move with caution and definitely try and interact with like, if you find an unknown truffle, first of all, send that to your local like university extension office because those things need to be described and can potentially help with conservation of land. So land can be protected for having like different diverse species that are like unknown or not found in any other, other place. So um, definitely send that to an extension office. Um, and then they can probably, you know, do the research from there. Yeah, I would definitely be a very cautious truffle hunter myself if I was looking for ones to eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> finding diversity is so is very important because yes, we're we're already cultivating European varieties before we even knew about the diversity of gourmet truffles in North America. Most of the scientists that have studied gourmet truffles are in the Pacific Northwest. So almost all of the gourmet truffle species in the East Coast or in the Midwest or the Southwest are undescribed. So if you do start looking for uh, gourmet truffles in your area, with or without a dog, there is a high potential that you're going to find undescribed species, which may just change up our entire economy here in the U.S. Yes, that's very exciting. So you're talking about looking for truffles, and that's great because we have a couple questions about that. Where are truffles found, generally speaking, if you are foraging for them? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Do you have to look for like certain conditions for them to be really populated in an area? Like, is there have to be like a certain they, they, moisture level? The different species of truffles produce their fruiting bodies seasonally, just like there are different mushrooms that come out at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. But almost at every time of the year, there's a different species of truffle that's fruiting under a tree or under a plant because they have associations with different trees and shrubs, mostly trees and shrubs, like woody type plants. But there are a lot of different plants that have truffle associations that's not trees or shrubs. Majorly trees and shrubs, um, rain is helpful, but the moisture they get from just being in association with the tree roots is, is enough for them to even throw out a couple small fruiting bodies. And then having a dog that knows how to find some kind of truffles is very helpful. Also, if you have the luxury of sitting and looking at the natural world for long periods of time, there is a good chance that you may see a truffle or, I mean, a, a squirrel or a bull or a chipmunk or a mouse digging in a hole that they're not living in 
and they will just eat some of the truffle and they will, they usually don't eat the whole thing unless it's really small and then they leave it for later. And then you can just go in there and take it. They'll find another one. They can find it easier than you can, but you can go take the truffle and probably dig around there and find another one. But working with animals is beneficial because they find ripe truffles. Truffles do not ripen outside of their environment. If you take them out of the ground before they're ripe, they will not ripen. Don't rake for truffles. There are people that will say that they rake for truffles. That's not an effective way to look for truffles. Um, it also damages the mycelium in the ground. There's some really gourmet truffles that were found in the, in the West Coast from Christmas tree farmer in like the 70s that started applying limestone to his Christmas trees, to the soil. The rise in pH made the environment very hospitable to truffles. He found them, sent them to local ag extension. They're like, oh my God, uh, these are gourmet truffles. Um, a lot of the gourmet truffles in Europe grow in, in, in the European countries that used to be coral reefs like the, the land mass used to be a coral reef um so the soil is is naturally higher in ph my buddy was was showing me different topographies in china that's limestone and there's a lot of truffle production in china uh high ph soil here in pennsylvania we have some novel truffle finds um and we have a lot of karst topography here with limestone so the, a lot of the gourmet truffles definitely like a, a high ph soil or tend to like high pH soils, but that, that's not to say that that's it. There's truffles that's even written about in Quran that's like potatoes that they still consume in the in the Middle East and the deserts um, that grows with like sunflower type plants. So that's not high pH. So yeah, lots of different types. Lots of different. Things. Yeah, that is really cool. Now you're talking about bringing along like an animal, like a dog, to help you look for truffles. Are there any other types of animals that people have? used before to help them find truffles? I know like pigs come to mind, like truffle pigs. People do use pigs, but pigs like to eat the truffles more and they'll fight you about it. <laughs> and they will bite your fingers off if you try oh. and take it out of their mouth. So there are old truffle hunters in like Italy and France that's like missing some fingers from fighting with a pig. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, okay, yeah, so they, a dog sounds better. Yeah, dogs, they, you know, they're really good at finding them. They don't care about eating them as long as you give them a treat. I mean, like, they don't want to meet, they don't really care about eating them regardless. They just want a treat. So, yeah, dogs are really good at it, and they can run around really fast and find a bunch really quickly. Now, on to using truffles. Let's start with maybe the taste. I'm sure there's, like, a wide variability when it comes to what a truffle mushroom tastes like to people. Do you have a way that you would generally describe it? And does it kind of vary for people to taste almost like cilantro, where some people genetically even taste it differently? A hundred percent. Everything is like that. Our genetics are so diverse. We are not the same. Everybody, the dose of anything is different. The smell of everything is different. Your body is different. Your, your chemistry is different. The way you interact with anything is going to be different. That's just off bat. I always let people know that's the way I feel about that. But as far as truffles go, there is such an incredible diversity in flavor, aroma profiles. There is a huge lexicon for describing truffles from, you know, gas, gasoline, alcohol, gunk, aromas, sulfur, compounds, eggs, sex pheromones, human odors, paint, cherries pineapples, uh, different fruits, vinegar, cheese. There's all sorts of different types of smells that you'll get from truffles. All sorts of different flavors, different species. Like the Oregon black tends to smell like uh, very ripe pineapples. The Oregon white smells more to me like a Versace cologne, like a sharp kind of alcoholy, intense saginess. But yeah, there's all sorts of variations in the smell. That's really cool. So then going to like how to use it, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on medicinal qualities later. What are some ways that maybe you've incorporated truffles into your cooking or like popular ways people have, have utilized them? I mean, a lot of people will store their truffles with fats. The volatile compounds of truffles bind very well to fats. Storing it in a container with butter, with, you can even keep the butter in the wrap. You can even keep the cream in the container as long as it's like one of those like cardboard containers and the smell will even sink through. Eggs, you can put them next to eggs and it'll absorb the smell. Culinarily, a lot of people are just on like shaving it on hot food. 
um, shaving it on, you know, any kind of hot food, meat, eggs, pasta, hot vegetables. Um, shaving it on hot food allows the aromas to really come out and then just eating it fresh um, is really the dynamic experience. And, and because they're expensive for a lot of people, a lot of people are, are mostly just consuming just a little bit at a time. You know, we're working on freeze drying them and incorporating them into a lot of different kinds of products right now um, and exploring consuming them in larger quantities. Uh, because I think that that's where a lot of the uh, medicinal activity is going to come in. A lot of the bioactivity is going to come in. You know, if people take what I say emotionally, then you got hit by the rock. If I throw a rock into a pack of wolves and one of one of them is going to get hit. And if you got hit, then that's because you got hit. Um, and that's the way I'll leave it, you know, because otherwise I'm not talking about it. But because we live in a capitalist economy, when people find the truffles, they're under economic pressure to sell those truffles for a high price and bring in money to their house. If we didn't live in a system this way, if you found the truffles, you may be inclined to eat all of them yourself. You may be inclined to eat a lot of them, but because it's so valuable, you might just shave a little bit yourself and sell as much as you can. So if you could imagine before humans were in, under pressures like this, if you found a nice trove of truffles, you might take it home to your family and enjoy it with your family and your community and eat all of them. And you have to eat them fast because they go bad very quickly. When you consume a significant amount of them, more than a shaving, they have a lot of very interesting bioactive compounds that trigger different functions in our body from mentally stimulating to aphrodisiac and everything in between. There's a lot of different compounds in these truffles that can make our bodies feel different ways or affect different metabolic function, tumors, all sorts of different things. So really interesting potentials there, especially when we are able to actually eat them instead of taste them or use them like a seasoning. So I think that when more people are hunting truffles, like before World War One and Two, there were hundreds of tons of truffles being found in, in Europe. It's dramatically decreased and it's part of the reason why the price is so high. But when more people develop culture of finding and consuming truffles in North America, more people will be able to consume a larger amount of truffles than they were able to consume before. And I think that this will culturally affect us um, whenever cultures come across advanced nutrition. It affects generations of, of cognitive capabilities and physical capabilities. That kind of answers the next question I was going to ask. Why are truffles so expensive? And was there any other thing you wanted to add to that explanation on, on kind of why you think that is? I really like the exclusivity. There's a lot of people that still think that truffles are like a, an exclusively natural product. A lot of truffles are still pulled out of the wild in Europe, but more and more truffles every year are cultivated. So the truffles are starting to be cultivated, but still it takes like nuance. It takes actually owning land or being able to lease some land for extended periods of time because like when you plant truffle trees, they may not yield five to seven years. So a lot of people that are doing this are actually land owning individuals, which in this day and age is extremely wealthy. There's exclusivity to it. Or if you know, if you're getting land access, you want to be able to pay for that land. Um, you're going to be able to, you need to make sure that, uh, that everything's paid for. So it's, it's, it's an expensive process right now or training a dog to find them and then having the time to go out and get them and everything like that. It's, there's just in, inherently taxed. So there's a lot of reasons why it's expensive. And, uh, and a lot of the truffles that do come from Europe have to be overnight shipped on an airplane to get to New York fresh enough um, to be distributed and still be delicious and valuable once they're at the restaurants and things like this. Outside of foraging for truffles, are they available for purchase? And like, what's kind of the form they come in if you wanted to just go to the store to try to find some? Um, if you went to the store to try and find some, the only actual truffles you may find may be like a little flake of a truffle floating in the bottom of an oil or something. Most stores do not sell truffles. Um, a lot of stores sell truffle oil that's made with synthetic truffle, uh, uh, one sulfide compound that smells like truffle that is synthesized. Um, so it's fake. And if you consume it a bunch, it'll pervert your senses for the actual truffle. So you're, whenever you go to actually taste the truffle, it may be a little bit dulled or something. 
you have to be able to find a, a distributor of fresh truffles to get fresh truffles or like be at some like high-end grocery store. I think there's a store that sells truffles in like Seattle, far west fungi in like the northwest, Northern California, they sell truffles at their store. Um, and then maybe some other like bougie grocery stores around the U.S. or something like that may have them. Onto that medicinal properties of truffles, what are some things you wanted to highlight about how medicinally truffles can be beneficial for people? Well, I'm really focused on on the cognitive aspect right now. In in my research, I've seen a lot of literature from you know immune support to anti tumor properties to all the like a whole host of different things. But I've I've kept my focus on the nootropic aspect and. There's limited research there, but I want to amplify on it myself. So the anandamide melanistic truffles is being produced at enough of a, of a amount to stimulate adult neurogenesis in humans. Um, so I want to continue to develop on that because I believe that we can benefit from advanced neurological systems or advanced neurological functioning. Um, and that's really what this kind of stuff means. Like a lot of people are focused on this now with like lion's mane and other Hirishim species. But I think in developing novel, unique, neurologically active cocktails of natural products that we can really amplify on metaprogramming the human biological computer. Um, that's really the the direction that I want to go in is becoming self-programming entities. We have a lot exposed to us right now, and there's a lot of understanding and a lot of literature on how to program humans, um, even from the sense of like how we educate our children and what we want everybody to know, what media we're exposed to, and all these kinds of things. Um, and when we understand this, coupled with understanding that there's, comp that there's functional foods like truffles um, that we can eat we can put ourselves in environments where we're able to learn nuanced skills, put ourselves in diverse environments and really become a, a new type of human or really become a, a human that we want to be. Um, and that's beneficial for the life that we're trying to live instead of just being subject to whatever we were exposed to. So yeah, that's really where I'm looking at it from. But again, they do have a lot of immune supporting functions. They do have a benefit for libido anti-tumor property. Definitely recommend just like diving into some uh, research papers, check out Google Scholar um, and research the individual truffle species names. I mean, you can find a whole host of research that's been done on them. I think the last question I wanted to ask you is, we touched on that idea of cultivating mushrooms. And if someone were thinking about something like that, is there any feasibility around somebody doing that at home if they just maybe they don't have like a big area to work with or anything like that. Is that anything right now on the horizon that's capable for, for folks at home? Or is it a pretty like big operation in terms of cultivating? For truffles, it depends on how nerdy you are. Or want. <laughs> like I've met some real nerds out there. Like a lot of people call themselves like biohackers and there's a range of them. So like, again, unbiased, like there's some people that are doing genetic engineering. There's some people that's doing just doing interesting breeding projects and things like this, but there's some people that are doing micro propagation of plants. I don't know if this is something that you guys have talked about on the podcast at all, or have featured in mother Earth news. Well, it's a way of single cell cloning plants, cloning plants from such a small amount of tissue. You can grow them out without viruses. Like you can separate them from viruses and all these different kind of things. Um, so it's like really like growing plants on like petri dishes and then like agar and little containers and things like this. Um, and then you can also with hormones in the uh, in the medium that you have your plant in, um, you can trigger the plant to stay a specific part. So like the chemistry of the plant, you can get a root to turn into a branch that turns into a leaf. And it's all the chemistry of the plant and the environmental conditions that's that's telling those cells to be a root or to be bark or to be a leaf. So with environmental triggers and hormones in the medium, you can make the plant stay a root or make it just produce a leaf or make it produce bark or whatever. Micropropagation techniques, I think that you can like maintain a root of a oak tree or a root of a hazelnut tree in, um, in a controlled environment setting. And I think that you could probably induce truffle fruiting on it somehow. I think anything's possible. 
I don't know all the steps that it will take to do that, but I could imagine the steps that it could take to do that. And that's really all it takes to make something real is, uh, you know, being able to think about it. I don't know. People may call you crazy for being, for thinking about stuff that's out of the box, but the people that were thought were crazy that we use their technology now. <laughs> Absolutely. So if there's anybody listening and that's piqued their interest, <laughs> it might be something to explore. A hundred percent. Please do that and you will be rich. Whether or not it's dollars, all value comes from nature. So when we remember that, we'll be the generation that becomes more wealthy than any other person that extracted wealth from nature and then made an illusion, illusory wealth system to um, maintain their, their assets. Wrapping up our episode, uh, William, do you want to share with people where they can follow you and Mycosymbiotics and what you're doing? And do you want to share anything exciting that's coming up that uh, you want listeners to know about? Join our newsletter at mycosymbiotics.com to stay up to date with everything that we're doing. You can catch us in a city near you soon, I guarantee. Just finished up MycoFest. It happens the first weekend in August every year. So anybody hearing this, definitely check that out. Um, it sells out every year. Um, it's always an amazing event with people from all over the country coming out and sharing their talents. We'll be doing the NEMP foray in uh, New York. I don't know if there's still space for that, but it's the Northeastern Mycological Federation foray. And uh, that's going to be up in New York in August. I believe that's in the Adirondacks or the Catskills. Second week of September, we're going to be up in Michigan for Camp Compost. Um, so that's a really great event, Upper Michigan. And it's going to be a lot of education around soil, around compost, around fermentation. Um, I'll be talking about truffles and I'll be doing some like hands-on mushroom cultivation classes. Uh, the following weekend on the 14th uh, through the 17th is the NEMP 4A in upstate New York. On the 22nd to the 24th, we'll be doing a mushroom event at the Hawk and Hawthorne north of Asheville, North Carolina. Just check us out at those events. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of just be keeping a low profile for the rest of this year while I work on, on writing some books, while I work on refining my business to be better for our community. Wow, that's a lot of exciting stuff going on. So yeah, we encourage listeners to get connected. And if you're in the area for any of those events or want to go over there, we would definitely encourage you to check that out. And I know we'll be doing another podcast episode, I think for October on cordyceps. So mm -hmm. that's something also that listeners can look out for. William's going to be back with us soon. <laughs> in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us for this episode today. I learned so much. It was so interesting to hear about truffles. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I appreciate the platform. I really encourage every person to take a moment to take a look at your life and think about how much of your actions are for you and your family and how much of your actions are supporting some rich person that doesn't really need your money anymore, some, some big company that doesn't really need anything from you um, and redivert your life force supporting clean soil, clean water and space and time for good people to enjoy it. So um, thanks for listening. And, uh, you know, I hope to interact with you all in the future in real life. Thank you. We thank you, the listener, for joining our podcast and encourage you to share it with your friends, colleagues, and family. To listen to more podcasts and to learn more, visit our website, www.MotherEarthNews.com forward slash podcast. You can also follow our social media platforms from that link and email us to ask any questions for upcoming podcasts. And remember, no matter how brown your thumb is, you can always cultivate kindness. You've just heard our episode about truffle mushrooms with William Padilla Brown. You can reach us at podcast at ogdenpubs.com with any comments or suggestions. Our podcast production team includes Jessica Mitchell, John Moore, Kenny Coogan, and Alyssa Warner. Music for this episode is Travel Light by Jason Shaw. This Mother Earth News and Friends podcast is a production of Ogden Publications. Learn more about us at MotherEarthNews.com. Have you ever wanted to meet our podcast presenters in person or take workshops from them? You can by going to one of our many Mother Earth News fairs each year. You can take hands-on workshops, attend information-filled presentations, 
and shop from our many vendors specializing in DIY ideas, homesteading, and natural health. Our last fair of 2023 is coming up in West Bend, Wisconsin, September 16th to 17th, and you can meet many past podcast guests there. Visit MotherEarthNewsFair.com to register, and be sure to use the code FAIRGUEST for $5 off at checkout. Until next time, don't forget to love your mother.